Hello, back to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21. This is New Testament video 224, Luke lesson 67, Luke chapter 21, verse 9. Heavenly Father, as we continue the Olivet Discourse, as recorded in the Gospel record of Luke, bless this time of study. In Christ's name, Amen. Luke chapter 21, for the context we will start at verse 5, review some of the prior lesson. Luke 21, 5. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, and the which there shall not be left one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down, that's the Jerusalem temple. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not, therefore, after them. Verse 9. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. So we will teach in this study verses 9, 10, and 11. That's all we'll get to here. <laughs> they are complex verses. There's a lot of material to unpack various ideas, assorted ideas there, to expound. If we go back to Matthew 24, Matthew 24 for the parallel, Matthew 24 for the parallel, verse 1, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Mark, Mark, Mark 13, Mark 13, verse 1. Mark 13, 1. 
And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, verse 6, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. The Olivet Discourse, back to Luke chapter 21. This is the end times sermon of Christ Jesus. He is sitting on the Mount of Olives. That is to the east of Jerusalem, east of the temple complex. He's here, Mount of Olives. Here's Jerusalem, the temple in blue here. He's high above Jerusalem and the temple on the Mount of Olives, looking down. He left the temple complex and he went out to the Mount of Olives. As the disciples were leaving the temple with him, the decorations, the ornamentation of the temple complex stunned, awed the disciples. Look at the goodly stones and gifts. It's recorded in Luke. Beautiful, attractive structures. Of course, there's that eastern wall with the golden plates that would glisten, radiate in the morning with the rising sun shining on it. They see that golden wall, gold-plated wall, as they exit the temple complex in the city, go to the Mount of Olives there. All the gold, the precious metals, the precious stones, the quarried rock walls, how humbling it is. Lord, look. The stained glass, windows, the vaulted ceilings. The exquisite woodwork. Oh. The Lord says, do you see that? That'll all be demolished. There will not be one stone upon another left here. Luke 21, verse 6. And as for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Remember, this is not AD 70, when the Romans invaded Jerusalem under General Titus and burned Herod's temple. This indeed, at the time of Christ, is Herod's temple, but that is not the temple being destroyed in verse 6. I'll tell you why again. You see, 
if we mix prophecy and mystery, we will look for prophecy being fulfilled in the mystery program. That can't be, can't be. Either prophecy is operating or mystery is operating, not both. Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was speaking of nothing that relates to the dispensation of grace, nothing that relates to the church, the body of Christ, absolutely nothing. Verse 6, there will not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. If we make that A.D. 70, and that is Herod's temple bulldozed, we have a problem. And there have been complainers and whiners that Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. Because after all, even today, the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall it's called, remains. And there are stones left upon each other. And how could Jesus tell them that their temple would be destroyed and no stone would be left upon another and yet today the temple is destroyed AD 70 and we still have stones upon another Jesus wasn't referring to Herod's temple in AD 70 the temple isn't in Jerusalem today I'm aware of that there is no functioning temple in Jerusalem. Has it been for 2,000 years? Under the Antichrist, and we'll see that in a future lesson here in Luke 21, there is another temple. That's the one to be present when Christ returns. If I go back to Matthew, verse Three of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, 3. Listen again. Verse 3, Matthew 24, 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What things? Verse 2. There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. When? When? Verse 3. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Whatever is going on concerning a temple in Jerusalem is in relation to the return of Jesus Christ, his second coming. That is the purpose of the Olivet Discourse. Now, now listen, again, if we make Herod's temple destroyed in AD 70 as a fulfillment of this opening passage in the Olivet Discourse, what we're doing then is opening ourselves up to saying Jesus came back in AD 70. Because didn't he say the Jerusalem temple would be destroyed when he returned? Well, that's just it. This temple that he's referring to here is the Antichrist's temple. Now, had our dispensation not interrupted prophecy, had mystery not begun with the Apostle Paul, Herod's temple would have been present at the time of the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist would have already come by now, 2,000 years ago. They were waiting for him in the book of Acts. Prophecy would have just run uninterrupted. However, it was interrupted. And if we fail to see it, and often the professing church has all these centuries, Look at the confusion. Thank you, denominationalism. If we ignore the dispensational boundary that begins with the Apostle Paul's salvation and commissioning, then we will not see the distinction between prophecy and mystery. 
will wind up mixed up. Since prophecy has been interrupted, whatever Jesus was referring to in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially here, the Olivet Discourse, doesn't pertain to us. We're in a different dispensation. We're in a different agency. The church, the body of Christ. We will not see ourselves in these passages if we understand the Bible rightly defined. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The Olivet Discourse must, 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 I hope you get my point, must be considered, believed, dispensationally. Hold that thought. Back to Luke 21, verse 8. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. Hmm. A whole lot of that concerning the Bible. No matter the age. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not, therefore, after them. I am warning you, my disciples. I am advising you concerning things to come. Eschatology. I don't want you to be ignorant. Little flock especially, Israel's believing remnant, I want you to be aware of what will happen while I'm away. I'm leaving. In just a few days, he will die. Less than two days, he will die. In the coming weeks, after his resurrection, he ascends to his father's right hand. I'm going away to receive a kingdom. The kingdom, I'm coming back. While I'm away, here is what happens to the world system. Here's what happens to Jerusalem. Here's what happens to the temple in Jerusalem. Here is what will happen with the Gentiles in the Middle East. And we'll get to that here. In this lesson, in our last study, I opened the Olivet Discourse and I reminded you that Luke presents an abbreviated form, like Mark. Matthew has the entire sermon, two whole chapters, almost 100 verses. Mark has a shortened form. Luke has a shortened form. I am teaching here primarily Luke because we've taught Matthew verse by verse. We've taught Mark verse by verse. Now we're in Luke verse by verse. So I will remind you as I did in our prior lesson, if you want the Olivet Discourse in its entirety, Go to our Matthew studies. Matthew chapters 24 and 25. That would be New Testament videos 75 to 82. 75 to 82. Matthew lessons 70 to 77. Eight lessons. Eh? Matthew lessons 70 to 77. I taught... <laughs> the Olivet Discourse for 12 hours in Matthew. In Mark, I taught a shortened version of it because, of course, Mark, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, presented an abbreviated form of the Olivet Discourse. So you can also look at our Mark studies. The Mark studies are New Testament videos 139 
to 143. Mark chapter 13. Mark 13. Mark lessons 39 to 43. Mark lessons 39 to 43. New Testament videos 139 to 143. The Mark studies don't go into as much detail as Matthew, but Matthew and Mark go into more detail than Luke. Luke has some special passages here in chapter 21, and we'll get to those eventually, <laughs> Lord willing. Luke has that Gentile, that national scope. Matthew has the kingdom aspect, particularly. The Olivet Discourse is an outline of what will happen leading up to Christ's second coming, what will occur at his second coming, and what will follow his second coming. I'm going away. So I want you to have this information in mind while I am away, while I'm gone at my Father's right hand. I'll come back. For now, I'm absent. Let me point this out again. Let's go back to the Passion Week timeline that we and beginning with the Palm Sunday entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. Palm Sunday is gone. Monday, gone. It's Tuesday of the Passion Week. Tuesday, the Olivet Discourse is delivered. Remember... In Luke chapter 19, the Lord expected Jerusalem to know of her day, the time of her visitation. Remember at the close of Luke 19, we covered that. Jerusalem, you were to know of some events, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, me riding on the donkey into your midst there to fulfill Zechariah. But you didn't recognize me. You didn't see with, with the eyes of faith what I was doing, who I was, and so on. And I had painfully laid out for you Daniel 9 on the timeline. Daniel 9 has 70 weeks foretold there. Israel, the people, Israel, will require 490 years of cleansing, whereas their land needed 70 years of cleansing. Their souls, the people's souls, would need 70 weeks of years for cleansing. And then the kingdom would be established. That's Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And I had told you, back in Luke 19, Daniel's 69th week there ended so, 69 weeks of years, which would be 483 years, the time from Nehemiah 2 to Messiah here is finished. It's over. The 69 weeks of years are terminated. They end on Palm Sunday. So listen, watch. You don't have to be a mathematical genius. If Daniel said, prophesied, there would be 
490 years, 70 weeks of years, 70 groups of seven years, septets of years, and 69 weeks of years, or 483 years, or expired. What's left? How long is left? Well, one week of years. It's seven year period. The 70th week of Daniel must be fulfilled. The 69th week is over. Messiah, according to Daniel, dies after the 69th week ends. So, if Messiah dies at the end of the 69 weeks, there's one week of years left. Daniel's 70th week. And that is the purpose of the Olivet Discourse. One week left, one week left, one week of years before the kingdom must come to pass. Okay. Now listen, you don't have to be a genius here either. If there was one week of years left, seven years left on the prophetic timeline there, and then the kingdom would be established. Where is the kingdom? It's been 2,000 years. Uh, remember what I just told you? What God is doing today is something else. Eh? That's why this, the 69th week, the 70th week, following it, the 70th week has not come yet. It's delayed, postponed. The kingdom is delayed, postponed. Prophecy is delayed, postponed. Because God is doing something different today. And we read about that in the Apostle Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. If we want to mix prophecy with mystery, go ahead. Spiritual destruction. So let me bring this out now. Remember from our Daniel studies, when we were in Daniel verse by verse long ago, you'll look at this and remember, I had this out back when we were in Luke 19, 69 weeks of years come before the cross, one week of years after the cross, here's Daniel's 70th week, people are cleansed down here. Here is the dispensation of grace, the age of grace here. Here's where we are. Daniel did not see us, though. Daniel doesn't say anything about us in Daniel 9 because God didn't reveal it to him. The Holy Spirit kept it a secret from Daniel. It wasn't for Daniel to know about. That was the secret committed to Paul's trust, the Apostle Paul. Okay. The 70th week will come sometime out in the future. Still hasn't come to pass yet. There is a 2,000 year long delay because of our dispensation running. The 70th week didn't immediately follow the 69th week because there was a gap in prophecy. For instance, there was a one year extension in early Acts. Call to repentance. Israel's renewed opportunity for repentance in the opening chapters of Acts. Prophecy is further delayed. Not only because of Israel's unbelief, kingdom is delayed, also because of our program, the kingdom of Israel is delayed. Okay. After the 70th week, those seven years, their second coming to end. And the 70 weeks are finished, and there's the kingdom. Literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom of God, the Vedic kingdom in Israel. We're not there yet. Still aren't there. Jesus is speaking of that time, future from us, leading up to his return. And what comes after? All right. So with that out of the way, we can come back to, now I better remove these, yeah, get distracted. We, 
put this away. Come back to Luke 21, verse 8. In our last lesson, some review again. In our last study, I told you because Messiah has been rejected, Jesus is going to the tree of Calvary. I have come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If one come in his own name, him ye will receive. John 5, 43. Since the true Christ has been refused, then Israel gets the false one. And he will deceive them. The Antichrist will come in before the singular Antichrist arises. There are other Antichrists. So, Israel in the last days will be highly confused. Spiritual darkness, blindness. They won't know spiritual up from spiritual down. Now, the believing remnant will see, have discernment into spiritual matters. But apostate Israel, no, they'll follow the Antichrist. Listen to Luke 21, 9. Luke 21, 9. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. You will hear of wars and commotions. Wars and commotions. Back to Matthew 24, verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. You will hear of wars and you will hear of news, of impending wars. See that you be not troubled, for all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Mark 13, verse 7. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Wars and rumors of wars. Wars and rumors of wars. Wars and commotions. The word commotions there, special to Luke. Commotions. In that context there, wars and commotions. Commotions would refer to political and social unrest. Instability. Tumult. Confusion. Disorder. Disturbances. You will hear of wars and commotions. But don't be afraid. For these things, verse 9, Luke 21, 9. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Don't be terrified. Don't be fearful. Verse 10, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Matthew 24, verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And Mark 13, For nation, verse 8, shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Disturbances, violence, battles, political wars, Societal wars, unrest, especially in the Middle East. Okay. Come back to Revelation 6. Revelation 6. 
Revelation 6. So leave a marker in Luke 21. You can leave a marker in Revelation 6 too. <laughs> Revelation 6 verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. The first seal judgment. This begins Daniel's 70th week. The arrival of the Antichrist. In Revelation 6 here, these are often called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, apocalypse referring to the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, that's the uh, Greek word, apocalypsis. In Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the book of the Revelation is sometimes called the apocalypse, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. He's hidden away in the third heaven, and then he appears, okay, his second coming. Anyway, Revelation 6, 1 and 2. The first seal judgment is not the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Antichrist. He is a counterfeit Messiah. He looks like Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, that's Jesus Christ on a white horse. Here in Revelation 6, someone is riding a white horse, but it's not Jesus Christ. This is the Antichrist. He goes forth with a bow. He has a crown. He goes conquering and to conquer. The Antichrist, he's a violent man. But he doesn't appear to be that initially. He comes in peaceably. We'll look at that in Daniel. The Olivet Discourse, these opening verses, match Revelation 6 and these seal judgments. So, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Go ye not therefore after them? That verse corresponds to the first seal judgment of Revelation 6. Now, if you come to verse 3 of Revelation 6, here is the second seal judgment. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him, that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So there's a white horse, there's now a red horse. One on a white horse, first seal, Antichrist. One on a red horse. That's Antichrist too. That's another aspect of his arrival. Outbreak of war. The red horse. Peace is taken from the earth. Come back to Revelation 6 later. If we come over to Daniel 11. Daniel 11. Daniel 11. Daniel 11, and I go into greater detail in the Matthew studies. Matthew and the Olivet Discourse. In Daniel 11, we read, beginning in verse 5, Daniel 11, 5, to the end of Daniel chapter 11. That concerns the future. Okay? Daniel 11, 1 through 4, that is history. Okay? 
For Daniel, this was all prophecy. This was all future. Okay? Well, since Daniel's time now, Daniel 11, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 are history. The prophecy there of Alexander the Great dying and his empire divided into four regions and so on. We taught that in Daniel verse by verse long ago. Out of one of these four regions of the Greek empire, Alexander the Great's empire, out of one of those divisions comes the Antichrist. In Daniel 11, 5, all the way through to verse 20, we have a series of wars. Some kings of the north, north of Israel would be Turkey or Syria, fighting against some kings of the south, Egypt, that'd be Egypt, south of Israel, Egypt. Four kings of the north, Turkey, Syria, fight against three kings of the south, Egypt. That's future from us. After they battle, and this goes on for some years, then the Antichrist arrives. He arises. So, I'll say this. After the rapture, are gathering together unto Jesus Christ in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, while we are taken to rule and reign in the heavenly places, Prophecy resumes. Daniel's 70th week doesn't immediately start. It takes some years. But eventually, look at Daniel. No, wait. We'll go to that chapter in a moment. Daniel 11 first. Daniel 11, verse 21, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of the flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. He's the prince of the covenant. That covenant now we can go to Daniel 9, verse 27. Daniel 9, well, look at 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah, Jesus, be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come, the prince that shall come is the Antichrist, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. See that war there? There are some wars with the Antichrist. And he shall confirm the covenant. Verse 27, Daniel 9, 27. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Daniel's 70th week. Seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations... He shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The Antichrist will make a covenant with many for one week. Especially for Israel, with Israel. But it would also seem to be with her enemies too. We'll say more about that in a little while. By the time of Daniel 11, 21, the Antichrist comes. He obtains the kingdom by flatteries. He comes in peaceably. Now, if you recall, in Revelation 6, Revelation 6, listen, Revelation 6, 2, I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him, the white horse, had a bow. Well, where are his arrows? He comes in peaceably. 
He's interested in war and fighting. But who will come on his side if he is a violent man? Those kings of the north and kings of the south in Daniel 11 had come before him, future from us, but before Revelation 6, 1 and 2 there, those kings of the north and kings of the south had fought for Israel's land. A series of battles. Well, the Antichrist, he is the fifth king of the north, apparently. He enters the scene, and unlike his forefathers of the north, those other kings of the north who fought, he will come in with a new strategy. He will come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So he will appeal to Israel. I won't be violent. I'll be your friend. Friend. He comes in peaceably and they don't suspect what he's engaged in yet but they'll they'll see eventually what happens revelation 6 2 he that sat on the white horse there had a bow but no arrows and a crown was given unto him he reigns and he went forth conquering and to conquer uh-oh war war the book of psalms Psalm 55. You can let go of Daniel now. Psalm 55. Psalm 55, verse 20. Psalm 55, 20. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. In the midst of the week, he will break that covenant, that peace treaty with Israel that he will make with them. He has broken his covenant. Verse 21, Psalm 55, 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. Trouble. But he's a sneaky, cunning, crafty man. Israel, I am your friend. I am your Messiah. I am your deliverer. Believing Israel isn't deceived, but unbelieving Israel is. Part of the Antichrist's covenant there with Israel is he will make them to be at peace with their enemies. Their ancient enemies will now be their friends too. The Antichrist will cause Israel to disarm. I will protect you. I'll protect you. You don't need a military. You don't need to fight wars. We're at peace here. False peace. False peace. This is a time of great deception. All because the truth has been rejected. The true Messiah is absent. And look, the fake one here. In Isaiah, Isaiah 10, the Assyrian, Isaiah 10, the Assyrian, historically, yes, that's the king of Assyria, centuries before Christ, but the Antichrist is also called the Assyrian. That is in Isaiah. That is actually Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30, verse 31. The Assyrian will be beaten down 
through the voice of the Lord. The, vo the voice of the Lord, that's the return of Jesus Christ destroying Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2. The Assyrian, eh? well that's not history, that's future. Eh? Jesus never returned yet, hasn't returned yet, that's future. In Isaiah 10, verse 5, this is historically the king of Assyria. Prophetically, this is the Antichrist. O Assyrian, Isaiah 10, 5, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mar of the streets. Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. See the violence? The violence. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Israel is calm and relaxed. Oh, trouble. There is sudden destruction. Peace and safety. Uh-oh. Just the opposite. All the longing for peace in the Middle East, all these centuries now, these past two millennia, all those who have proposed strategies to have Israel to dwell peaceably, peacefully in her land. The, 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 the two-state solution, give the Palestinians some land and let Israel have some land. We can all join together and love each other. No, unfortunately, sin complicates that. The Peace in the Middle East. Ooh, that's, that's actually a dangerous concept. Because the Antichrist will use that as a campaign promise. I will bring peace. He'll be lying. Okay? But the hunger for peace in the Middle East that we see now, the yearning for peace in the Middle East. Now, all the wars that have been fought over that land that God gave Israel forever, the Antichrist will say, shh, stop it. Let's all get along. Let's all love each other. Deception. Deception. He will be the most violent man in history. There will be no true lasting peace in the Middle East until the Lord Jesus Christ sits on David's throne. The Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. There will be peace. We won't have it until then. We can pass legislation. We can have our summits. And we can sign our treaties. There will be no peace, lasting, perpetual peace in the Middle East until Jesus Christ sits on David's throne in Jerusalem after he destroys Israel's enemies, including the Antichrist. Luke 21, 9. You will hear of wars and commotions. Don't be terrified. Whatever we've seen in human history concerning wars, that'll be nothing compared to this. But, my little thought, don't be terrified. Don't be afraid. Don't be frightened. You will behold some terrifying events. But don't worry. These things must first 
come to pass. But the end is not by and by. It's not immediate. You think it gets so bad, oh, civilization is coming to an end. No, actually, it will get worse, worse, far worse, far, far worse. Verse 10. Then said he unto them, Luke 21, 10, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Now these sinners, <laughs> that's what they are. James 4, James 4, James 4, verse 1 and verse 2. James 4, 1 and 2. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Inside sinful heart. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. War. Because of sin, war is unavoidable. Now, listen, we can be pacifists. We can g give up all our weapons and say, I'm a peaceable person. Okay. While that's commendable, it's foolish. How do I know that? Because when you release your weapons, is there any guarantee your enemies will give up theirs too? Okay. So what will you do? When you throw away your weapons, you say, I'm a pacifist, I don't believe in war. What will happen to you when those who do believe in war come upon you? Getting back to Luke 21. Nations are fighting nations. Kingdoms are fighting kingdoms. Why? War is the result of sinners wanting to take what other sinners have. I want land, I want power, I want money, I want this, I want that, and I will fight you to get it. Cutthroat. While God's earthly kingdom is not here, the evil world system is in effect. Now, with Christ return, the end of the world comes. The end of the world, the evil world system. Okay. Human society doesn't end. Human society with Satan loose does. Okay. There's a new king on the throne when Christ comes back. Satan is bound in the bottomless pit. Revelation 20. All the unbelievers in earth's governments, all the fallen angels in heaven's governments, they're all deposed, removed from office at that point. The saints reign. All those with new natures who no longer have a sin problem, they govern creation to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the king of everything at that point. Yeah. Until this world gets to that point, what a mess. What a mess. Wars. Wars. In Psalm 83, come over to Psalm 83. In Daniel, we can come back to Daniel, I guess. Daniel 7. Daniel 7, verse 7. 
And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great arm teeth, it devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Some political insight here. I considered the horns, Daniel 7, 8, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Th that is the Antichrist. Okay? Verse 24. Daniel 7, 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings. See the interpretation? We don't have to wonder. What are the ten horns? Ten kings. Okay? That shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first. And he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. The Antichrist comes in. He persecutes the saints, the little flock. Israel's believing women. I want you to see, though, here, the Antichrist gets a political advantage by conquering three of ten kings. Three out of ten kings. He starts his policy of domination here. I will advance in the Middle Eastern governments these ten kings are my way to do that. I will conquer three of those ten kings, and then by conquering them, vanquishing them, I will capture all ten kings. And all ten kings are now under the Antichrist. He will take control of those nations. So there will be ten ally nations of the Antichrist. We're building this little by little. If you go over to Psalm 83, Psalm 83, Psalm 83, these ten nations are outlined here in Psalm 83. Listen, Psalm 83, 1. This is not the revived Roman Empire. This isn't Western Europe. This is the Middle East. The prophecy speculators, they run to Europe, they run to Rome and say, those are the ten kings. Uh, listen, we don't westernize the Bible. The battle between God and Satan doesn't concern Europe and the United States the Middle East. Okay. From Genesis to Revelation, the battle between good and evil concerns the Middle East. Okay. Especially Israel's land, the land of Canaan, the land of Palestine. It's also called in Scripture Palestina. Which actually is related to the word Philistine. The Romans named that land after Israel's chief ancient enemy, the Philistines, or Philistines, Palestine, Philistine. Anyway, okay. Psalm 83, listen. A psalm or psalm of Asaph. Keep not thou silence, O God, verse 1. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. Your enemies, God, and they that hate thee, have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, that's Israel, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel 
may be no more in remembrance. If Israel were to disappear forever, prophecy would fall apart. If God is finished with Israel, if Israel were annihilated, the Bible would fall apart. And that's why Satan is always attacking Israel throughout history. <laughs> A wise adversary, Satan is. He knows what he's doing, which is more than what we can say for the average Christian today. Psalm 83, verse 5, For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Listen, here are the ten nations, the tabernacles of Edom, and the Ishmaelites of Moab, and the Hagarines, Gabal, and Ammon, and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre, Asher, that's Assyria, Asher also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot, Selah. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook of Kison, which perished at Endor. They became as dung for the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb. Yea, all their princes as Zeba and as Zalmunna, who said, Let us take our selves the houses of God in possession. O oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth the wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire. So persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the Most High over all the earth. There's his reign. Come back! See, thy kingdom come. Return, Christ Jesus. Come back and deliver us from our adversaries, our enemies. That's the prayer of the little flock. They're asking for the second coming to destroy all these ten Gentile enemy nations. They've united under the Antichrist. Okay. Edom. You will notice these nations here are Middle Eastern, not European, not American. Edom. The descendants of Esau, Jacob's twin brother. Jacob is the father of the twelve tribes of Israel. The tabernacles of Edom, the Edomites, are Israel's own flesh and blood relatives. The modern Palestinians and southern Jordanians, Ishmaelites, that was the son of Abraham through Hagar. Remember, Abraham had another son, Isaac. Isaac is the father of the Jewish race. So the Ishmaelites, they are the blood relatives of Israel. The modern Saudis, the Ishmaelites. As per the Quran, they believe that Ishmael is the heir of the Abrahamic covenant, not Isaac, when the Holy Bible says that Isaac is the heir of the Abrahamic covenant. They are, they're all fighting to take what belongs to Israel. Moab, Moab, you see there Ammon, Moab and Ammon, those were Lot's descendants through his incestuous relationships with his daughters. Moab, and Ammon. Lot was Abraham's nephew. Moab, the modern Palestinians, the central Jordanians. Ammon, the Ammonites, modern Palestinians, northern Jordanians. Uh, Agarines, modern Egyptians.
Gabal. That's the land of the Edomites. South of the Dead Sea. Hezbollah, northern Lebanese. Amalek. Amalek. He was an Edomite, a grandson of Esau. The Amalekites were the first Gentile nation to fight Israel when Israel came out of Egypt. Exodus 17. Amalek, the modern Arabs of the Sinai Peninsula. Verse 7, Philistines. Philistines, the ancient bitter enemies of Israel throughout the period of Judges and especially Kings Saul and David. Don't forget Goliath, Philistine. The Philistines, modern Hamas of the Gaza Strip. Look at Tyre. Tyrus, Phoenicians. Modern Hezbollah, the southern Lebanese. Verse 8, Asser, Assyria. Asher. They had deported those ten northern tribes of Israel in the Assyrian captivity 700 years before Christ. 2 Kings 17. All these ancient enemies of Israel will be the allies of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will ultimately conquer them, three of them. He will take control over all ten. And he will cause Israel to believe that those ten nations are their allies. Eventually he will weaken Israel and have those nations fight Israel. Israel is disarmed, unsuspecting, unbelieving Israel. That's what Israel gets for rejecting Jesus Christ, the false Christ. These nations, these wars that lead up to Antichrist, and these wars that come after the Antichrist is exposed for what he is, duplicitous, in addition to wars and commotions, political unrest, civil unrest, Luke 21, 11, there will also be great earthquakes in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Oh, it does get worse, doesn't it? Matthew 24, Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. Birth pangs. Creation is going through a birthing process. A new nation Israel is being born, the little flock. And just as those contractions occur in greater frequency and multitude, when a physical delivery happens, so these phenomena in creation grow more intense as the birth of the new nation Israel comes to pass, leading up to the return of Christ. And Israel is ready to go into the kingdom, redeemed, restored, the little flock, Messianic church. Until then, though, oh, this is just the beginning of sorrows. Some worse, quote, contractions are coming. Mark 13, Mark 13, 
Verse 8, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. See how Matthew and Mark closely read. The seal judgments again, back to Revelation 6. So we've gone through the first two seal judgments, the Antichrist arriving, ascending to power. We've seen now the wars that result leading up to him and following his arise. Now Revelation 6, verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast saying, Come and see, and I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts, saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast, say, Come and see, and I looked, and be a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sore, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So we have now the third seal and the fourth seal. The third and fourth seal. The third seal is famine. The fourth seal is disease, pestilence, hunger, death, the beasts of the earth. If you come back to Luke 21, verse 11, see this? And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. So we have great earthquakes, famines, pestilences, fearful sights and great signs from heaven. The earthquakes. If you notice, see the famines and pestilences, Luke 21, 11, the third and fourth seals. As for the great earthquakes, that's the sixth Seal. Now we'll skip the fifth seal and we'll do that in our next study. The persecution in Revelation there. Come to Revelation 6, 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. If you come back to Luke 21. Luke 21. Don't be afraid. Well, look at this now. Great earthquakes in diverse places. Verse 11, why would they be afraid? <laughs> Perhaps because of this? Famines, pestilences, fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. By the way, stop, 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 stop. The fearful sights and the great signs from heaven. Luke 21, 11. The silliness that some people teach from the Bible. Be careful. This has nothing to do with UFOs and the invention of the space shuttle and space stations. <laughs> the, the, the fearful sights and the great signs from heaven they're already interpreted for us. Okay? Revelation 6. You see the, the sun there becoming black 
as sackcloth of hair, Revelation 6, 12, and the moon becoming as blood, the stars of heaven falling unto the earth. Okay? Those, those are the fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Okay? Creation is experiencing tremendous change, changes. The earthquakes, the earthquakes. We'll read more about earthquakes in Revelation 8. Revelation 8. Revelation 8, verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. There's another earthquake, Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Revelation 11, 13. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. That's Jerusalem. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Another earthquake, Revelation 16, 18. Revelation 16, 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. There, that's toward the end of those seven years. Earthquakes in diverse places. There'll be earthquakes throughout Daniel's 70th week. The book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 24, says the earth will be going through convulsions, reeling like a drunkard, <laughs> wobbling, in outer space, famines, there's a famine, hardship concerning the obtaining of food there. Revelation chapter 8, there's hail and fire mingled with blood cast on the earth. A third part of the trees was burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Judgment. Vegetation is burned up. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28, all these courses of judgment, all five courses of chastisement are running during Daniel's 70th week. Deuteronomy 28, 15, the curses, 16, You'll be cursed in the field. 17, your basket and your store, cursed. See the hardships, Leviticus 26, 18. Leviticus 26, 18. The heaven, I will make your heaven is iron and your earth is brass and your strength shall be spent vain. For your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. Their crops are cursed. There's a drought. There's famine. Awful. How awful. In the book of Luke, back to Luke. Luke chapter 21. Lost my place here. <laughs> Luke 21 Pestilences, 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 diseases, physical illness, outbreaks. Matthew and Luke have pestilences. Mark has troubles, difficult situations, social problems, natural disasters, epidemics. That's the law of Moses and the curses again. Leviticus 26, 23 to 25. Deuteronomy 28, 21. Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. The famine, that was the second course. Look at the sickness here, physical sickness. Verse 16. I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, like thinness, and the burning 
ague, inflammation, like fever, that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. Your soul, your seed in vain, your enemy shall eat it. Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28, verse 21. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. Look at verse 22 there. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning, with the sword, the blasting, the mildew, eh? the curses. If we come back to Luke, Luke 21, once more, turn back to Luke 21. Luke 21, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Something else that will happen. Joel 2, look at Joel 2. Joel 2, verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. That's his second coming. Peter quotes this in Acts 2. The Spirit of God has been poured out, according to Joel 2, in Acts 2. Now we're waiting... Peter is preaching to Israel. We're waiting for the wrath to be poured out. And it would have come back in the book of Acts had God not paused prophecy and begun mystery. Come over to Revelation 8. Revelation 8 now. Revelation 8. The fearful sights and great signs in heaven, from heaven. Revelation 8. 10 to 13. Here's another one. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter, poisonous. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them were darkened, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. The sun and the moon and the stars are affected. Daylight is not the same, nighttime is not the same. Earth's movements in outer space are disturbed. These people will be scared out of their minds. Daylight and nighttime hours are all messed up. These signs, they indicate Something is happening in creation. Something bad. And something good too. Judgment is coming, but there will be deliverance. Evil is coming to an end. And righteousness will reign in its place. Earthquakes, famines, pestilences, fearful sights and great signs... Shall there be from heaven? Now, again, the Jews require a sign. We're not looking for signs. Okay? This is not the time of the signs. So we don't look for signs of the times. You want to look for something? Look for the sins of the times. Okay? Sins of the times. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at the sins of the times. Okay? 
those who tell us to look for the signs, okay? they're mixing prophecy and mystery again. Look for the signs of the times. No, we're not looking for signs. We are the church, the body of Christ. Okay? Israel looks for signs. That is their right, their birthright. Look for signs. We don't look for signs. The Apostle Paul never tells us to look for signs. But prophecy tells Israel to look for signs, and rightly so. All right. And before all of this, there's some other trouble. And that's the persecution, the fifth seal. We'll look at that next time of Israel's believing remnant. This is enough. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to teach. And we will resume the Olivet Discourse in our next study. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen.